Hi, my name is Kristen Fletcher. I'm the Programs and Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Haley Public Library. Tonight's talk is Franklin and Winston, The Friendship That Saved the World with historian Lee Pollock. Lee will examine the unique and fascinating relationship between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill and discuss how their interaction impacted their times and altered the course of history. I always like to feature a book uh, that we have here at the library and I hope this, this works. Um, this book is called The Allies by Winston Groom. It's an examination of the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin and how that partnership um, impacted World War II. So it uh, looks like a pretty interesting book written, uh, published in 20, uh, 2018. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Lee Pollack. Lee is an acclaimed writer, historian, and public speaker on the life and times of Winston Churchill. His writing about Churchill has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, The New Criterion, and The Daily Beast. And he has appeared on CBS, the BBC, and other media outlets in Britain and the United States. He has spoken widely about Churchill's legacy and leadership at venues ranging from the U.S. House of Representatives, the Pentagon, and the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as to leading universities, history museums, nonprofit institutions like our own, and clubs. Lee is a trustee, an advisor to the board, and a member of the Operating Committee of the International Churchill Society. He previously served as the society's executive director. A native of Montreal, Canada, he is a graduate of McGill University and holds a master's degree from the University of Chicago. Lee is the author of a forthcoming book, Action This Day, Adventures with Winston Churchill. And without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Lee Pollack. Thank you so much for joining us, Lee. Kristen, thank you for putting this program together. And before we get on to um, Churchill and Roosevelt, um, let me give a shout out to you and all of your colleagues at the Haley Public Library for all the good work you've done, especially in the last couple of years as we've all tried to figure out this pandemic. Um, Winston Churchill was a man of words and um, a great writer and um, wrote over 50 books during his lifetime. He once said, words are the only things that last forever. And uh, libraries are wor where words live. Um, and in this age, it seems like um, bad information drives out good information in many um, subjects. So your local public library like HPL is a, a great resource and deserves our support. Um, I'm a, proud to be a member of the Friends of the Haley Public Library. So anyone who's listening either now live or when they watch this recording in future, I think, Chris, if I'm right, it starts at as little as $5 a year. And if, if this free talk isn't worth $5, then I don't know what is. So um, support your local public library. It's a wonderful organization. Yep. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Lee, and, uh, and for reminding me to tell people that um, this is being recorded. And with a little bit of light editing, uh, we will then post it on our website. So it's available 24 seven. After the talk, I'll send out a link, uh, sorry, an email with that link and some uh, additional information as Lee mentions it during this talk and afterwards. So, um, but let's just start out firstly, um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the International Churchill Society and um, how long you've been involved with them. Sure. Um, I've always been a great history buff. I spent my professional life in the commercial real estate industry, but always loved history and was on the board of the International Churchill Society. And then the board chairman turned to me one day and said, um, I told him I was retiring from real estate and was going to take golf lessons. And he immediately and very presciently responded, you'll never be good at that. So 10 years later, that's pr proven to be the case. But he said that the Churchill Society doesn't have an executive director, so why don't you do that? And that was my transition from life in the business world to a wonderful second career um, in the Churchill world. Um, the International Churchill Society is a worldwide member organization of people interested in Churchill's life and legacy. Our website, which is winstonchurchill.org, gets over half a million visitors a month. 
we publish a wonderful quarterly Churchill magazine called Finest Hour. Uh, we maintain our um, office at a place called the National Churchill Leadership Center, which we created at George Washington University a few years ago. Um, we, we welcome interest of people who are interested in Churchill and his legacy of leadership. So if you're anyone who's interested in joining, just go to winstonchurchill.org. You'll find everything you want to know about Churchill and uh, we'd welcome you as a member. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I, I know you're interested in history, uh, but and I know you'll be talking about Churchill throughout this, but what was your personal attraction to studying and really becoming an expert in Winston Churchill? Um, well, Churchill had an enormously long and complicated and interesting life. I sometimes say to people, you can admire Churchill, or you can point out his faults and failures, which, which were considerable, but you can never say he was boring. And he also had an exceptionally long career um, he was in the House of Commons for over 60 years, and that was during a time, the first half of the 20th century, when so many iconic and earth-shattering things happened. Two world wars, the Holocaust, fascism, communism, the atomic age. It was an exciting time to be alive, and Churchill had his finger in almost you know, every important issue of that critical half century. And that's, I think, what makes him such a fascinating person. He is a lens uh, through which you can view some of the most important decades and most important events and occurrences of modern times. So this particular talk tonight is about Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt. And I mean, they're truly two of the most iconic figures in 20th century history. Can you tell us a little bit about their background and how their careers progressed? Were they similar to each other? Were they different? Did their lives follow a similar career path? Could you give us a little insight into that? Sure. Um, both of these men were definitely patricians. Let me start with um, Franklin Roosevelt. He was born in 1882, which made him eight years younger than Churchill. He came from a very old line New York family. Um, supposedly, some of their money had come from trading in opium in the, in the 19th century. Um, this is his birthplace, Hyde Park, which is open to the public today. It's about two hours outside of New York. Very much worth, um, worth a visit. Um, uh, Roosevelt's father was 54 when he was born, and he was overshadowed in the future president's life um, by his mother, Sarah. Uh, Church, uh, Roosevelt had an elite upbringing. He went to um, Groton School, um, boarding school, where his headmaster, a famous man named Endicott Peabody, described him as, quote, a quite satisfactory boy, but not brilliant. Um, <laughs> he, of course, went to Harvard College, as um, Yankee patricians should. Um, and then Columbia Law School, and he took up um, a Wall Street legal practice. There was nothing in his early years that would bespeak of a future greatness. Um, Churchill's early upbringing was more dramatic. He was the grandson of one of the greatest aristocrats in Britain, the Duke of Marlborough, and he was born here at Blenheim Palace, <laughs> another wonderful place to visit. Um, for any of you who have seen it, I think you'd agree with that. And if you haven't, next time you go to England, it's, it's well worth a trip. Um, Churchill's father was this man, Lord Randolph Churchill. Um, Lord Randolph was the younger son of, of the Duke. Um, he was elected to Parliament in 1874, when um, his, the same year his son Winston was born, and he was only a few years later in the cabinet, and some people thought would be a future prime minister. Um, he wasn't, as it, as it turns out, which is another interesting story. Um, like Roosevelt, Churchill had a very powerful mother, um, this woman, and beautiful, man, might I add, um, Jenny Jerome, who was a Brooklyn-born heiress. Um, unfortunately, as the years went on, the uh, Jerome family fortune dribbled away. And by the time Churchill enrolled at the Royal Military uh, College at Sandhurst, um, they were living um, from paycheck to paycheck, except there weren't any paychecks. That's an, a whole story of Churchill's life. Um, Churchill followed in his father's footsteps into politics, he started out as a celebrated cavalry officer and war correspondent, and took his seat in the House of Commons uh, when he was just 25. As I mentioned, um, he remained in the House of Commons, with this a short exception, uh, for over 60 years. Um, he was in the cabinet a few years later, and um, 
1911, he became first Lord of the Admiralty um, when um, he was only 37. Um, the Admiralty was Britain's principal weapon of war. It was a position that Churchill greatly enjoyed. And needless to say, he liked the medals and the wonderful uniform that went along with that, as you can see from this, um, from this slide. Um, at the same time, Franklin Roosevelt entered politics as a supporter of President Woodrow Wilson, who made him Assistant Secretary of the Navy. This is a photo of, of Roosevelt from 1917. Um, Churchill, in his own right, had a dramatic early career. Um, he was blamed for the failure of the Gallipoli invasion and um, demoted and then forced out of the cabinet. Um, the 1920s saw opportunities for both of these men. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was a surprise choice as vice president on the Democratic ticket in 1920. Um, he lost, and then in August 1921, the following year, he was stricken by polio. Um, that disability was something that was um, concealed from the American public from the rest of, for the rest of his life because it was felt that being perceived as handicapped would have ended his political career. Um, but one thing I think that's true is that the challenge of that illness made um, Franklin Roosevelt um, harder and more resilient, but I think it also made him more sensitive to the struggles of average American people. He returned to politics in 1928, becoming governor of, New of the state of New York, um, and then in um, 1932 president. Um, for Churchill, the 1920s were another you know, period of excitement and change. Um, the Liberal Party that Churchill had joined in 1904 collapsed in the early 1920s. He then lost um, three elections in a row, but to his surprise was brought back into government in the, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, the second highest position in the cabinet in 1924. Um, that kept him at the forefront of public life for the next five years, but the Conservative government was defeated in May 1929. That began a decade in which Churchill was out of office um, that became known as his wilderness years. Uh, it was during that time that he became the first prominent voice to warn the Western democracies of the rising challenge of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi movement in Germany. Franklin Roosevelt, as I mentioned, became president in 1932 at a dire time for the country. This is one of his campaign posters from that um, election and a photograph of him campaigning. He had, a, he, had, he had, as you can tell from this photograph, a sparkle in his eye in ways which made him, despite his, his handicap, a wonderful campaigner and a very effective politician. Um, as uh, Roosevelt was rising to the heights of power in the 1930s, Churchill was stewing on the sidelines. Um, a British historian later wrote a biography of Churchill up until 1939, and he entitled it Winston Churchill, A Study in Failure. And if that book had been published in the 1930s, most people would have agreed with that title. And ironically, throughout that whole decade, these two men of destiny never met and never spoke. Boy, that's fascinating. Um, talk about two people who had trials placed before them and just kind of kept leaning into them. That, that's, that's fascinating. So um, part of what this talk is about is about the Second World War. Could you speak to the, 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 um, Words not coming to me. The 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 what was going on internationally? Um, what what triggered it? Um, why different countries got involved? Um, just and what the early role of Churchill would have been in that? And and kind of how did he and Franklin eventually meet? Um, well, as I, as I mentioned, um, Churchill was effectively sidelined um, by the British government during the nineteen thirties. Um, Neville Chamberlain had become prime minister in 1937 and was famously a proponent of appeasing Adolf Hitler and the other dictators in the hopes that some lasting international peace would result from that. That was a misguided and, um, and dangerous um, philosophy to say the least. Um, 
after um, the failure of the Munich Agreement and the Nazi occupation of all of Czechoslovakia, it became clear by the summer of 1939 that a new world war was um, going to break out shortly. And the only question was um, when and how that might be. And I think any doubts about that were extinguished in the summer of 1939 when to the shock of the world, Nazi Germany and uh, the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact um, that cl uh, cleared the way for the Nazi invasion of France and the rest of Western Europe. Um, this is a famous photograph of the Nazi foreign minister, uh, Joseph Ribbentrop, and the Soviet foreign minister, Molotov, signing the agreement. Um, Stalin is the man um, with the mustache in the back with a smile on his face. And when um, Joseph Stalin smiled, you had to wonder what he was um, thinking about or what he was going to do. And, and of course, the um, photograph on the wall right above them is, is of Lenin. Um, the war proceeded quickly um, with the German invasion of Poland. Uh, Warsaw fell in three weeks. And then on September 17th, 1939, the Soviet Union invaded the eastern half of Poland and took that over. Um, in short order, both in the German and in the Soviet occupied parts of Poland, they were soon imprisoning and murdering their enemies. They were Jews, intellectuals, political activists, many nuns and priests. Um, the five-year ordeal, both of Poland and the rest of Europe, was um, about to begin. Um, Churchill returned to the government and the cabinet immediately after the outbreak of the war as First Lord of the Admiralty, which was ironically the same position he had held at the start of the First World War, exactly 25 years before. It was said that a three-word message went out from Admiralty House in London, the headquarters of the Navy, to all their ships around the world, and the message was, quote, Winston is back. Um, for the next nine months, um, uh, what happened was called the phony war because there was little military action. Um, that all changed in the spring of 1940. There was an unsuccessful British campaign um, to control parts of Norway. Um, and with that, the dissatisfaction with the Neville Chamberlain government that had failed so miserably to stop the war boiled over in the House of Commons. There was a strenuous debate on May 7th and 8th and Chamberlain resigned and the King summoned Winston Churchill to become prime minister. Those of you have, might have seen the wonderful film Darkest Hour by, um, which featured Gary Oldman a couple of years ago is a very dramatic portrayal of those times. Um, there's a story about Churchill that evening, May 10th, as he's returning from um, um, visiting the King at Buckingham Palace. That was the same morning, ironically, that the Germans invaded Holland, Belgium, and France. Um, as Churchill was driving back from Buckingham Palace, the car was unusually quiet, and his um, bodyguard, Walter Thompson, tried to break the silence by congratulating Churchill on his new position, but saying, I wish this had come to you in better times. Um, I hope it is not too late. Um, Churchill brooded for a moment and said, it may very well be too late, but we, could only, we can only do our best. Um, and the, uh, the coda to that conversation, uh, by the time Churchill went to bed at 3 a.m. the next morning, um, his mood had lightened considerably. He wrote in his memoirs years later the following, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. I was sure I would not fail. Brave words indeed. Um, but five days later, uh, Churchill had to uh, send a cable to Franklin Roosevelt in Washington. The two of them had been in communication since Churchill returned to government the previous autumn. And this is what Churchill uh, wrote to the president. The scene has darkened markedly. We expect to be attacked here in the near future. And we are getting ready for that. If necessary, we shall continue the war alone and we are not afraid. But while he tried to reassure Roosevelt of Britain's resolve, he also warned of an alternate course. And this is what he said. I trust you realize, Mr. President, that the voice and force of the United States 
may account for nothing if they are withheld too long. You may have a completely subjugated, Nazified Europe established with astonishing swiftness, and the weight may be more than we can bear. Churchill asked Roosevelt for substantial American military aid, but the president declined. Quite simply, he and his advisors were unsure of Britain's ability to keep on fighting. And more importantly, I think American public opinion was opposed to entry into the war on Britain's side. Roosevelt was a shrewd politician and he always wanted to lead public opinion but never get too far ahead of it. Uh, the next 12 months from May 1940 to May 1941 were the grimmest but also the most glorious in Britain's long history. The army was famously um, evacuated successfully from the beaches of Dunkirk. Britain won the Battle of Britain thanks to the bravery of the RAF. They narrowly survived the U-boat menace in the Atlantic and avoided defeat at the hands of General Rommel in North Africa. Um, Adolf Hitler in the meantime, having failed to defeat Britain, turned his attention to the Soviet Union, which he invaded in Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941. And finally, by this point, Roosevelt and the United States were ready to start helping Britain. There was a, a deal to provide destroyers to the British Navy in exchange for American bases on British possessions in the Western Hemisphere. Um, 50 rather old and somewhat rusty American battleships and destroyers were sent to Britain. This was one of them, the USS Abbott, um, a quick coat of paint and a change of flags, and it became HMS Abbott. Um, Roosevelt was reelected decisively in um, November 1940, and with that political success, he was able to extend more assistance um, to Britain. Even so, one of the things he said during his campaign was, quote, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. And the next major step was the Lend-Lease Agreement, which passed Congress barely by one vote in, excuse me, in um, March of 1941. Um, Roosevelt sent Harry Hopkins, his closest advisor, to London to check on the status of the British war effort, and Hopkins returned to Washington being very favorably, favorably impressed. Um, after hearing Hopkins report, the president sent a handwritten note um, to Churchill, which was carried over by Wendell Wilkie, who Roosevelt had just defeated in the previous election. Um, this is what that note is. It's a, a quote from um, a poem by Longfellow, and um, the poem goes, sail on, O ship of state, sail on, O union strong and great, humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. And Roosevelt added himself, this verse applies to your people as it does to ours. And the next day, Churchill replied to the president's message in one of his most famous radio broadcast, which was sent both to the British and American people. And this is what he said. What answer shall I give in your name to this great man, the thrice chosen head of a nation of 130 million? Here is the answer I will give to President Roosevelt. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. And now it was time for these two men um, finally to meet. Um, they arranged um, a meeting um, in secret off the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, Churchill came on board, came over the Atlantic, uh, going through U-boat infested waters and one of the great British battleships, the, um, the Prince of Wales. And when they um, finally met, um, Roosevelt insisted on standing for Churchill. That was very difficult for him. Um, he was, like Churchill himself, a very, very courageous man. Um, this meeting in Newfoundland is called the Atlantic Charter Conference. It was a considerable success for the two of them to develop their own relationship and then also for their military advisors to plan um, the future of what was an emerging alliance. 
Um, one of the highlights of that visit, this is, this is a, a picture of the two of them meeting um, on board the Prince of Wales, August 1941, exactly 80 years ago this year. Um, one of the highlights of the meeting was a Sunday morning uh, prayer service on board the Prince of Wales on, on August 10th. You can see um, Churchill and Roosevelt seated together. Uh, Churchill um, personally selected every part of the service, um, the Lord's Prayer, the um, hymn, on, Onward Christian Soldiers. He was looking for anything that would emphasize a common moral and spiritual heritage of the two nations. Um, one participant in that service said afterwards, quote, in the long panorama of war, there had been no scene like this, a scene it seemed from another world rooted in the first principles of civilization. And Churchill was seen to tear up as the music played on that day. Um, less than four months later, in fact, why don't we go on to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do this part of the, the story. Um, less than four months later, um, in December, on Sunday evening, the first week of December, 1941, Churchill was at spending the weekend at Checkers, his country home. His guests there were Gil Winant, who was the new American ambassador who had replaced the um, disgraced and defeatist Joseph P. Kennedy, along with Avril Harriman, a, a name known well in Sun Valley, um, who was um, President Roosevelt's special envoy to Britain to coordinate the Land Lease Program. They turned on the radio at nine o'clock to listen to the BBC News and heard the announcer say, Japanese aircraft have attacked Pearl Harbor. Um, they didn't know what this meant. So um, Churchill immediately, or the ambassador, um, Wynand immediately called the White House and put Churchill on the phone. And Churchill said, Mr. President, what's this about Japan? And Roosevelt, Roosevelt replied, it's true. They have attacked us in Pearl Harbor. We are all in the same boat now. And those were the words that, um, that Winston Churchill had been waiting to hear for the last number of years that the United States and Britain were finally allies in the war together. Um, he later, Churchill later wrote in his memoirs, so we had won after all, after months of lonely fighting, Britain would live. Once again, in our long island history, we would emerge safe and victorious. And then he added, being saturated with emotion, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. Lee, I have a question about um, what was it about um, America's entry to this war that gave Churchill sense of, such a sense of um, relief? Um, I mean, was it the US's military might or just that he had another ally in fighting the Nazis? What, what was it about that? I think Churchill recognized early in the war that despite the fact that um, Nazi Germany had overrun um, Western Europe and was in a intense battle with the Soviet Union on the Eastern Front, that Britain could, and is, um, uh, Britain I would say also backed by its empire and, and colonies and the nations of the Commonwealth could survive, but Britain could never win the war and Nazi Germany could never be completely defeated without the United States. And he drew on his own experience in the First World War when somewhat the same thing happened. It was the entry of the United States into the war in 1917 that really set the stage for the surrender of Germany um, in November of the following year. And Churchill, you know, from the moment he became prime minister, dedicated himself very assiduously to cultivating everyone from the president on down. Um, there was one famous story that his um, son Randolph later told when Randolph was at um, number 10 Downing Street talking to his father. And this was at one of the low points in the war. And Churchill apparently was shaving. And um, um, Randolph said to his father, how are we going to possibly win the war and defeat uh, Germany? And um, Churchill turned to him and said, I know how we shall drag the Americans in. And, that, and that's, um, you know, it's, it still took um, the attack on Pearl Harbor um, for um, the United States to enter the war, both against um, Japan and then a few days later, Germany. 
um, Churchill, I think, once said, um, perhaps his daughter Mary had said this, um, no lover ever cultivated someone as assiduously as Winston Churchill did um, to Franklin Roosevelt. So Churchill realized, and that's why as much as um, Pearl Harbor was a, a shock and a tragedy, and then um, the Japanese rampage through Asia, the fall of Hong Kong on Christmas Day, 1941, and the capture of Singapore in um, February 1942 were great blows to the Britain and the British Empire. Um, but Churchill knew that in alliance with the United States, victory was possible. And I would add with the Soviet Union as well. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, so once they became allies, what what did they do? Was there like, um, did they meet and, and develop a strategy for moving forward? Well, the first thing Churchill did as soon as America entered the war was to um, to use a phrase of today, book the next ticket to Washington. Um, <laughs> he, he came over on the, another British battleship, the Duke of York, and basically moved into the, into the White House for almost a month. Mm -hmm. um, he was not an easy house guest. He stayed up late. He and um, Franklin Roosevelt would um, drink and eat and smoke and talk and um, and plan the war effort. And Churchill was, a, you know, it's hard to imagine someone, um, a foreign leader moving into the White House. And Churchill was literally on the same, uh, on the same floor of the, um, you know, the second floor residence of the White House as Roosevelt was. This is a, a famous um, Washington Post cartoon um, that was published in December 1941, just after Churchill had arrived. And Roosevelt saying to, um, to Churchill, go back to bed, Winston. That noise on the roof is probably Stalin or Chiang Kai-shek wanting to join our conference. They didn't, of course. Um, and it was an, you know, an exciting, there have been books written specifically about that visit. And it was um, an opportunity for the two of them to really develop that friendship. Um, and it had its, um, it, its humorous um, you know, sides as well. Um, there's a, um, a famous story that was recorded by the um, White House Butler, apparently one morning, um, the president had an idea he wanted to discuss with Churchill. So he had himself wheeled in his wheelchair into Churchill's bedroom. And Churchill apparently was emerging from the bath. He would sometimes take three or four baths a day and his towel dropped to the floor. And Roosevelt and Barris said, um, I'll come back later. And um, Churchill ever um, quick with a, a, a repost said, but sir, the prime minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the president of the United States. <laughs> a a, a well-worn story, Churchill and Roosevelt never confirmed it, um, but um, the, the White House butler said he was there and it was published in his memoirs some years later. And it's a, it's a classic account um, of, um, of the relationship that they were developing. Um, they also lit the White House Christmas tree together. There's a wonderful video of that you can find online um, and they, um, went to um, Christmas services at Christ Church in Alexandria. Um, they sat in the very same pew that George Washington had occupied himself, um, you know, more than 150 years, 50 years earlier. Well, that's remarkable, spending 30 days basically strategizing, getting to know one another, um, uh, kind of, I'm sure, sort of pushing a little bit this way and giving a little bit that way and, and really finding out about how each other exactly. operates. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, so this is something I wasn't aware of. Uh, apparently in the news recently, um, Prime Minister Boris uh, Johnson of England was at the Capitol in Washington, um, and he and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi um, talked about a particular speech that Churchill gave to Congress then? What, what was exactly. that about? Sure. Uh, well, the prime minister is a conservative like Churchill uh, and also a great admirer of Churchill. A few years ago, when he was still mayor of London, he wrote uh, an interesting, I think very engaging book um, about Winston Churchill. Um, some people think the book was as much about Boris Johnson as about Winston Churchill, but it's, it's worth um, reading. It's called The Churchill Factor. And like um, Boris Johnson, it's breezy, a little lighthearted, and certainly entertaining, but also full of some interesting, um, interesting insights. Um, the event that you're talking about was perhaps the single most important moment in that month that Churchill spent in Washington. He was invited to um, 
become the first foreign leader to address a joint session of Congress. And there's a photograph of him at that time. It was December 26th, the day after, um, after Christmas. And Churchill knew that this was an important chance to um, impress these members of Congress, many of whom only a few months before had been opposed to American entry into the war and not sympathetic to Britain's position. Um, Harry Hopkins, Roosevelt's advisor, warned Churchill that he might get a tepid reception. Um, there is, by the way, um, um, some video of this online that's worth um, watching. Uh, Churchill's great speeches in the House of Commons were never either photographed or recorded, um, whereas the US Congress allowed a newsreel camera. So this is one of the best um, videos we have of Churchill at, at his prime speaking to what he recognized was a very important audience. So it's, that's definitely worth looking at. Um, he won over his audience um, at the beginning of the speech by quipping, quote, I cannot help reflecting that if my father had been American and my mother British, I might have got here on my own. And the speech was all about the challenges and struggles that the new alliance would face um, against two powerful enemies, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Um, Churchill ended it with a famous, um, a famous line, quote, it is not given to us to peer into the mysteries of the future. Still, I avow my faith and hope, sure and inviolate, that in the days to come, the British and American peoples will, for their own safety and for the good of all, walk together in majesty, in justice, and in peace. And then Churchill flashed his famous V for victory um, sign, and there was a rousing standing ovation as he walked down the, um, the aisle of the Senate chamber. Um, he left Washington on January 14th and there was a farewell dinner with Roosevelt and Hopkins that evening. And Roosevelt's parting words to Churchill were, quote, trust me to the bitter end. And that was the signal to Churchill that this alliance would endure and would bring Britain to ultimate victory. You know, Lee, one thing that strikes me in your um, presentation is just how forthright these two gentlemen were about how dark the situation was. It seems like so much of what we hear now is how, you know, it's tough, but boy, just around the corner, everything's going to be great, or we're taking care of this and that and the next thing. Was that, was that, could you just comment on that? Um, because it does seem like they really faced the fact that things were really grim and yet they had a certain kind of faith maybe, or maybe it's hope. Um, I, I don't know what it was, but maybe you could just reflect on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, one of the um, secrets of Churchill's leadership, I think, was that he felt he had to tell people the truth, or at least, or at least most of the truth. But if he did that and shared that with him, but also remained optimistic and focused that you know, victory was possible, that he could lead the people you know, moving forward effectively. And I think that was one of the, um, of the secrets of his success. He didn't have a, a spin meister, um, you know, and he, he, one of the things he also did was to go out among the people, even during the bombing of um, London during the Blitz. Um, it is true that the first, um, you know, six months of 1942 were pretty dire times for Britain. The, um, the Blitz had come to an end and the German army was engaged in this, you know, fierce campaign in Eastern Europe. So the chances of an invasion of the British Isles had been greatly reduced. Um, but the first few months, as I mentioned, the Japanese rampaged through Europe and I think it's going to be through the Far East, and um, Britain lost its its colonies, uh, not India, fortunately, but um, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, the battle in the North in North Africa was going poorly. It was a very difficult, challenging time for Churchill, but he realized that this alliance would come to ultimate victory. Um, Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, as Napoleon's had been the previous century, was a, an exercise in hubris and a fatal um, blow. And um, the, ironically, after Pearl Harbor, 
Nazi Germany declared war in the United States first before the United States, as it would have done, would have um, done so in turn. Um, and for Nazi Germany to take on the combined population, industrial resources, manpower, technological sophistication of America and Britain and the Soviet Union ultimately was, um, it was a fatal, a fatal decision. All that said, it was still three and a half years of just bitter fighting and tremendous death between when America came into the war in December 1941 and then when the war ended in the middle of 1945. So did the war continue for three and a half years because it was so complicated? I mean, what what caused that to take so long, although we just got out of a year a war that's 20 years long, so maybe three and a half isn't so long, but, and then what roles did, did Churchill and um, Roosevelt play individually and in ways that they worked together? Well, the answer is it was an incredibly complex and um, and difficult war. Just some, you know, when I when I do this talk and more formally, I, I say, say to people, I'm not going to tell the whole story of the Second World War because that would take um, would take many many hours. But just think of some of the things that were going on. Um, Britain and Germany clashed in the desert of North Africa. Um, on the other extreme. Um, Britain continued to supply the Soviet Union and the United States did on what was called the Murmansk Run, which was sending convoys of merchant ships through some of the worst um, open waters in the world, um, where you would freeze to death before you even got to, um, to Murmansk, the Russian far northern port, where you could um, supply the Soviet Union. Um, there was a tank battle in 1943 between um, Germany and the Soviet Union at Kursk, there were almost 3 million men um, involved on both sides. Um, and there were 8,000 tanks, over a million casualties just in this one, one campaign. Um, in the Pacific, um, the US gradually rolled through a series of islands, but with bitter fighting. And before the war, no one had heard of Midway or Guadalcanal or Iwo Jima. Um, over Europe, enormous fleets of American and British bombers attacked Germany, sometimes over a thousand bombers flying together in, in a single evening. Mm -hmm. um, so the dimensions of the Second World War are just, are just incredible. And then the last thing I note to people is, and this is how I describe it, in the New Mexico desert in July, 1945, a new weapon was tested and a new age began. On seeing the explosion of the first atomic bomb, its creator, J. Robert Oppenheimer, remembered a Hindu holy verse, which went, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. And less than a month later, the two bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so it was an incredibly complex global war, you know, the greatest conflict ever in history, and hopefully one that shall never be repeated. Um, as to why it lasted as long as it did, um, Germany, despite the fact that it was outnumbered and facing an industrial powerhouse in the United States and Britain and the inexhaustible resources of the Soviet army, kept on fighting in the same way that the Japanese kept on fighting. In the First World War, the um, Soviet, the um, uh, Imperial Germany surrendered. Germany didn't surrender until the whole country was occupied in this war. Um, Churchill and Roosevelt through this um, whole period of time met a number of times. Here's a favorite picture of mine um, right after the Casablanca conference. Um, Churchill insisted that Roosevelt come with him to Marrakesh, which was a place that Churchill knew well from his visits there in the 1930s. He loved to paint there. And the two of them had this buddy bonding moment. Um, this is on top of a tower, which provides a panoramic view of Marrakesh. Churchill could walk up the stairs, Roosevelt couldn't. Um, and uh, several US servicemen who were there made a little sort of chair with their arms and carried Franklin Roosevelt almost like a sack of potatoes up these steps. And you have this wonderful photograph of the two of them together. Um, during, the, during the course of the war, the nature of their relationship did change and it wasn't ultimately as warm and as personal as it had been in those important years of um, 
1941 and 1942. Um, eventually, the preponderance of economic and military power, both of the United States and the Soviet Union, began to tell, and Britain became a junior partner in this in this alliance and this relationship. Um, and Churchill resented that because he saw the, the handwriting on the wall that even if Britain, America, and the Soviet Union prevailed in the war, that this would be the swan song of the British Empire, which, which it actually was. Um, there were times when um, Roosevelt made fun of Churchill and um, you know, tried to negotiate with Stalin behind Churchill's back. And those were things that Churchill resented, but there was nothing he could do about it because um, clearly the United States and the Soviet Union were the dominant powers and would become the two global superpowers at the end of, um, at the, end of the Second World War. Um, and then we can, we can talk about the Yalta Conference, which sort of brings that all to him. Um, to a, a conclusion. Yeah, I, I have a question before that, though. Um, I thought that Stalin um, signed, and I've forgotten the term, but a non, not resistance pact um, with Hitler. Yes, that was that was the slide I showed of um, yeah. the Hitler Molotov and um, mm -hmm. Stalin in August 1939. Um, and the, as, as part of that pact, ironically, the Soviet Union kept on supplying a large amount of raw materials to Germany, oil and other natural resources. Um, Stalin was playing for time. Um, and as you know, within barely a year, that is you know, by the fall of 1940, Adolf Hitler was always planning to, um, to attack the Soviet Union. Um, for Hitler, the Second World War was not a political or military exercise. It was an ideological um, compulsion to destroy what he called Judeo-Bolshevism. And so that it was inevitable that the, those two, um, um, two nations would come into conflict and um, the invasion of the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa in June, 1941 was you know, led to the, the greatest you know, conflicts and greatest battles of the Second World War. Um, you know, Soviet Union barely survived. Great, thanks for explaining that. Um, so finally, the war begins to draw to a close. Um, uh, just last year was the 75th anniversary of the Yalta Conference. Um, can you talk about how that conference set the stage for um, the world after this great war? Sure. Um, this is a famous photograph of the big three leaders, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin at the Yalta Conference in February, 1945. They had met once um, in 1943 at Tehran, but this conference, by this point, Germany was within a few months of surrendering. Russian forces had moved westward through Poland and into the heart of Germany itself. And this conference was a meeting designed to, um, to you know, dis decide on the future um, conditions of, of the, war of the world after the war and the foundation of the Soviet Union. This is a very controversial meeting to say the least. And to some people, it reflected a failure on the part of Churchill and especially Roosevelt to stand up to Stalin. But it was hard to stand up to Stalin when he was, he had the boots on the ground in Eastern Europe. Um, and one of the ironies is that Britain went to war, Britain and France went to war with Germany um, to, to protect Poland and in response to the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. And ironically, it was at the end of the war that Poland came under foreign domination once again, but this time from Soviet Russia rather than um, from Nazi Germany. Um, and there's been an endless amount written about um, uh, the Alta Conference and great debates about you know, what happened and why. There's a book I'll recommend to people that came out last year called The Daughters of Yalta. And it's about the um, Yalta Conference, but in particular about the fact that Churchill and Roosevelt's daughters were both there with their fathers, along with um, Kathleen Harriman, the daughter of, um, I'll call him Sun Valley's own Averill Harriman. And it's a wonderful 
that sort of human portrayal of fathers and daughters and definitely definitely worth um, worth reading and hopefully there's a copy in the Haley Public Library but if um if there isn't I shall donate one to you how about that <laughs> yes I believe there is so Good. what actually happened at the Yalta conference what decisions were made well um basically they set out the format for what would be the new United Nations um it was clear at that point that um the Soviet Union was, you know, was on the ground in Eastern Europe. Um, Stalin made noises about free elections and um, what soon developed after the war with Germany and then Japan ended that Stalin and the local communist parties and all those Eastern European nations were not really interested in free and democratic elections. And um, in the last, um, in the few months after um, Yalta, between February 1945 and April, um, of the same year, um, Churchill and Roosevelt gradually came to recognize um, Churchill first, Roosevelt more gradually afterwards, that Stalin could not be trusted and that um, the allied, um, the democratic powers would have to stand up to Russia and that Stalin's promises about, you know, freedom for Eastern Europe, you know, could, you know, were not um, things that could be, um, you know, accepted as, as reality. So um, did that happen on April 11th? And no. that's why that was so important? Well, uh, April the 11th. 12th. Yeah. The 12th, sorry, I misspoke. Right. Um, April 12th is a signature day in um, American history and in reality in the history of the Second World War because that was the day that Franklin Roosevelt died. Um, he, had become, he had been in increasingly poor health um, in the last 12 months. Um, he had um, congenital heart failure, which wasn't a condition that could be treated at the time. The fact of that illness was um, very carefully concealed. Few people knew about it. It wasn't even clear if Roosevelt himself knew how sick he was. Um, um, after Yalta, he came back to the United States and um, in April, you know, clearly exhausted in April, he went down to his home at Warm Springs, Georgia to try and recuperate the um, founding meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco was coming up in, in just a few months. This is um, an unfinished um, portrait of Roosevelt by an artist named Elizabeth Shumatov that was painted um, at that time. And this is the last photograph of him the day before he died. And to me, this looks like a man clearly on death's door. Um, Harry Truman, who had be, been vice president for barely a few months, became the president and um, it was a great shock to, um, to the world. Um, Church, uh, Roosevelt had been president of the United States um, for over 12 years. That is a, um, a record that's never going to be equaled because we had a constitutional amendment um, a few years later to limit people to two terms. Um, when Churchill heard this news in London, he said, quote, I felt as if it, I'd been struck a physical blow. Um, and he then, a couple of days later, eulogized Roosevelt in the House of Commons. And this is what he said. I admired him as a statesman, a man of affairs and a world leader. I felt the utmost confidence in his upright, inspiring character and a personal affection for him beyond my power to express today. And then he concluded with these words, for us, it remains only to say that in Franklin Roosevelt, there died the greatest American friend we've ever known and the greatest champion of freedom who has ever brought help and comfort mm. from the new world to the old. And I think that is a wonderful summation of the relationship between the, these two men. It's a beautiful eulogy. It's something well, um, well worth reading. A year later, uh, Churchill was in the United States for his Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, and made a point of going to Hyde Park, New York, Roosevelt's home to um, pl uh, place flowers on his grave. This is a photograph of him and um, Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's widow. Um, Churchill stood there in silence for 10 minutes, just thinking about Roosevelt and the relationship that they had had. Well, that's extraordinarily touching. Um, so, Churchill came here to um, and paid a visit to Roosevelt's grave. It, are, is 
Churchill, is there like a monument in the United States to Churchill? Is there a monument in England to Roosevelt? Was there any kind of uh, um, cross the Atlantic recognition that way of each individual's contribution to each country? Yes. Um, this is actually a photograph of a statue of Franklin Roosevelt that was placed in Grosvenor Square in London a few years after the war. It was funded by a public subscription and it was oversubscribed literally within um, a few mm. weeks. And this was at a time when the British people had been impoverished by the war, still struggling under um, stringent food rationing. Um, Grosvenor Square um, has been a center of American connections with Britain since the days of John Adams and Benjamin Franklin until just very recently, the US embassy was there. Um, this is actually um, at a square where there was also um, a statue of Dwight D. Eisenhower, and then one from the 1980s of, of Ronald Reagan. So it's a wonderful place. It's in the heart of London. It's definitely worth seeing. Um, there wasn't really an equivalent recognition of Churchill in a prominent place in Washington until a few years ago. And I'm pleased to say that our organization, the International Churchill Society, arranged for this bust of Churchill to be placed in the US Capitol. Um, when Boris Johnson was visiting the Capitol on Tuesday this week, he made a point of um, going to Freedom Foyer, which is where this bust is located, and being photographed with um, Churchill, his hero. So you can, you can find those pictures online. And um, Boris Johnson, who is, if nothing else, an ebullient personality, was clearly enjoying this. Um, this opportunity to be, to be um, shown together with um, Winston Churchill, his, um, his hero. How, how much Boris Johnson really resembles Winston Churchill is a, you know, a debate or a discussion for another time. <laughs> um, so I, I think we're at the point where we're wrapping up a little bit. I think there's some follow-up questions and some comments too, but I wonder if you would just take a moment to summarize your your thoughts and reflections on these two men. Just, you know, summarize their character and their personality and just talk to us a little bit about that, that sure. um, rich relationship they had with each other. Um, they were contemporaries. They lived in very similar worlds. I think their attitudes about government democracy were very similar. Um, Churchill once said of himself, I am a child of the House of Commons. And Roosevelt wrote at one point, the rulers of our democracy are not the president, senators, and congressmen, but the voters of this country. Um, one difference, I think, is that Roosevelt was a much more successful politician. He was elected president four times, um, never won, never lost an election in his, in his own right. Um, Churchill was elected to the House of Commons regularly, but when he became prime minister in the dark days of May 1940, it was by appointment, not by election. Um, famously, in July 1945, shockingly, um, Churchill and the conservative government were defeated by Clement Attlee and the Labour Party, despite having um, you know, won the war for Britain. Uh, Roosevelt was elected to his fourth term in November 1944, clearly in, in declining health. Um, Churchill returned as prime minister in 1951 with a very narrow majority, and even in that election, Labor actually got a few hundred thousand more votes. Um, so Roosevelt was the one with the greater political skills. Uh, I think both of them had a sense of destiny. When Churchill was 16, he said to one of his schoolmates, London will be in danger in the future and in the high position I shall occupy, it will fall to me to save the capital and the empire. And that's a, certainly a bold thing for a 16 year old to say. And then years later, when Franklin Roosevelt was accepting the Democratic Party nomination for his second term in 1936, he told the convention delegates, quote, this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. And I can't help but thinking that Franklin Roosevelt was thinking of himself at the same time. Um, both of these men believed in the power of words, and I think in their voices, words became more powerful than ever. We all remember um, Roosevelt's fireside chats during the depression, which rallied a shaken nation that he described famously as one third ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-nourished. And of course, Churchill's great speeches from, especially from 1940 and 1941, are justly famous and still quoted around the world and always will be. 
Um, they were different emotionally. Um, Churchill was an emotional person. He maintained very wide friendships and relationships with people on both sides of the Atlantic. He would frequently cry in public. Um, he said, quote, I'm a blubberer, so please, please excuse me. He had a famously long 57 and successful 57 year marriage with his wife, Clementine. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was a different kind of personality. He was cool, if not cold. He could be opaque and deceptive, what I call inscrutable and wily. Um, Harry Truman once said of him, quote, he was the coldest person I ever met. But then Truman added very quickly, but he was a great president. Um, Franklin Roosevelt's marriage with, Ellen, with Eleanor Roosevelt was a famous partnership, and she was a very influential public figure more in her own light more than Clementine Churchill was. But um, there were always closed rooms in, in Franklin Roosevelt's life. Um, John Meacham, a wonderful author who many of you probably know, and was also a trustee of the Churchill Society for many years, wrote an excellent book called Franklin and Winston. It's well worth reading. It's where a lot of my thoughts on the two of them come from. He said about them, and this is a quote, what would make Roosevelt a trying husband and a frustrating friend made him a great president. And then he added, what would make Churchill a tiring guest, which he was at the White House, and an exasperating friend made him a great prime minister. <laughs> and I think John continues and I think this is a good summary of what the two of them accomplished together. Faced with a world at war, Churchill and Roosevelt did their best to guide a coalition of nations through one of the defining storms of history. Sometimes one was right, sometimes the other, but they always stayed in the arena. If they had failed or fallen out with each other, we would be li living in a very different world. I think that's a wonderful synopsis of their relationship and what these two men contributed. And if I can add just with a, you know, an additional comment, when um, Churchill came to Fulton, Missouri to deliver the Iron Curtain speech in March 1946, um, it's famous for his line, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent of Europe. But what he also said, which I think he meant to apply to both, both Britain and America, and the title of the speech is not the Iron Curtain, it's the sinews of peace. And this is what he said. We, we, we must never cease to proclaim the great principles of freedom and the rights of man, which are the joint inheritance of the English speaking world. That is the message of the British and American peoples to mankind. Let us preach what we practice. Let us practice what we preach. And that I think is a good message for leaders of today and tomorrow both in Britain and in America. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Um, that was yet another astounding um, presentation on Churchill. What a fascinating man. Um, we have a couple of comments, a question yeah. or two. Uh, one yeah. question is, listening to or reading Churchill, uh, yeah, Churchill's um, writings, did he have a speechwriter? Did Roosevelt have speechwriters? Did they just write all this themselves? Ch Churchill did not have speechwriters because he was such a fantastic writer himself. Um, he would um, compose his, his speeches to parliament or on the radio um, by dictating them to a secretary. He didn't, you know, needless to say, he did not know how to type and he didn't write them out in longhand. But the speeches you hear and the books that he wrote and the articles, he wrote over 800 articles for newspapers and magazines during his life. And he wrote those all himself. Um, he was meticulous. He's, he's famous for his, what people think are off the cuff quips. Um, I, one of his colleagues once said, Winston has spent a great part of his life composing his off the cuff remarks. Um, so, so, and he was meticulous in, it was said at one point that for every minute of a speech, there was an hour of preparation. I'm not sure that was always the case. When you look at his um, speech notes, um, he would make um, changes in handwriting up until almost the moment before he would speak. And it's interesting to look at those um, to see how he developed his, um, his, speak, his speaking skills. Certainly the, one of the, recognized as one of the great orators of the 20th century. Uh, my understanding of Roosevelt is that he did have a number of speech writers in the White House um, Sam Rosenman was one. Um, I'm not as much of a um, Roosevelt expert as I am, you know, am in, at least in part uh, about Churchill, 
but I think Roosevelt's speeches, there were speechwriters in the White House, whereas Churchill's words were, um, were very much his own. By the way, um, for anyone who goes to London, if you go down Bond Street on your shopping expedition in London, right in the middle of Bond Street, where old Bond Street and new Bond Street uh, meet, is this wonderful uh, life-size sculpture of Churchill and Roosevelt together. And you can sit in between the two of them and have your picture <laughs> taken. And there's also another copy of this, if anyone goes to Florida, in the garden at the Society of the Four Arts in Palm Beach. It's an iconic, wonderful image of the two of them. And, um, a lot of people take, make make a point of sitting down in between the two of them and trying to eavesdrop. <laughs> um, we have a couple of comments. Um, uh, John says, other great books that discuss the Roosevelt-Churchill relationship are Citizens of London by Lynn Olson, which discusses the roles of Harriman, Governor Why Not, and Edward R. Murrow in London, and Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Eleanor and Franklin, uh, and No Ordinary Time. So I will include those, um, uh, those recommend recommendations when I send out the email to everyone. I know Lynn Olson well, she's a wonderful writer, has written a whole series of books about that period of the 1930s and 40s, both um, in Britain and America, and the one that um, she wrote about, um, Citizens of London is a wonder, wonderful story. She's a great writer. Great. And then Mike asks if you can suggest any other movies in addition to The Darkest Hour or a TV series that would give an accurate depiction of Churchill. Um, well, Darkest Hour is a wonderful film. Um, there's also a, a, a series from the 1980s called The Wilderness Years, um, which is, um, I think, available online. Um, they're um, playing Churchill is hard because people know what he looked like and what he sounded like. Um, if you play George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, maybe there's a, in Lincoln's case, a few photographs, but there's no video and no recording. So playing Churchill is hard. Um, Gary Oldman did that particularly well. Um, John Lithgow portrays um, Churchill in the Crown TV series, and that's a, another great performance, although I think um, uh, Lithgow's um, portrayal of Churchill is, makes him out to be a grumpy old man, which he, which he wasn't even in the 1950s. I do another talk, maybe we'll do this next year, called Churchill at the Movies, which is about the films that have been made of Churchill, but also about Churchill's own interest in film, which was considerable. He was a good friend of Charlie Chaplin and recognized the importance of film, supported Alexander Corda, the probably greatest director in, in British film history. So that's a whole interesting, interesting subject. Mm. And then um, John asks, can you describe the infamous affair between Avril Harriman and Pamela Churchill during World War II that led to Harriman's biographer to say that the war led to a suspension of many marriage contracts? Uh, yes, that's an interesting story. Um, the back backstory of that is Avril Harriman in 1941 was one of the richest, and um, if you've seen pictures of him on the ski slope, slopes in Sun Valley, a very handsome man. He was married at the time. Um, Roosevelt sent him to um, London to be the president's envoy to coordinate um, the Lend-Lease program with Britain. And what I would say about that is that um, if bombs are falling over your head, um, and I'll, I'll try to make a rhyme out of this, if bombs are falling over your head and you don't know when you might be dead, who knows with whom you're going to share a bit? <laughs> now, I, just, I just made that up and it's catchy. Um, so um, Pamela Digby Churchill at that time was 21 years old. She had just two years before married Randolph, the um, prime minister's son, who was somewhat of a wayward character, alcoholic and a gambler. Randolph was off at war. And in this exciting time in London, um, the, in the midst of this, terrible war, um, Avril Harriman shows up and he is, um, he is married, but his wife stays, stayed back in New York and he and um, Pamela Churchill, the prime minister's um, daughter-in-law take up together, which is, I guess, a nice way of putting it. Um, that relationship eventually ends. Um, Pamela also had relationships with Ed Murrow, the famous CBS news broadcaster and um, with a number of other prominent people. Um, there is actually a big new book coming out about um, 
you know, the woman who became eventually Pamela Harriman um, that's coming out in a couple of years. Um, one of the questions of history is, did um, Winston and Clementine know of the relationship that their daughter-in-law was having with this extreme, this very important American? And if so, did they turn a blind eye to it? Um, I think they probably did, or at least um, were wondering about it, but um, Avril Harriman was you know, the most important American in London at a very important time for Britain. So that's the uh, that's sort of the backdrop to that story. Um, Pamela Churchill and Randolph Churchill divorced in 1945. The, ma the marriage had been a failure almost um, from the get-go. Um, she then married um, Leland Hayward, the successful um, a theater producer. Um, after his death, she um, reconnected with Avril Harriman in 1971. They married a couple months later, and um, she then became um, a supporter of a relatively unknown Southern governor named Bill Clinton, who once he became president, sent her to um, be the American ambassador in Paris, and she was highly successful in that role. So she's a fascinating person. One of my other talks that I do, you know, very much designed for yeah, this community is um, the Churchills and the Harrimans, friends and leaders in war and peace. It's all about the relationship between the two families and Avril Harriman and Winston Churchill and Pamela in particular. Thank you. Um, you gave that talk uh, for us um, a year ago, I okay, think. Okay, and, that was my day. Mm -hmm, and yeah. we have it archived on our website. Okay. So um, it's, it's an it's excellent a, it's a, talk. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. I will have to add, Winston Churchill was not known to ski although his wife Clementine was actually a very good skier in Europe in the 1930s. <laughs> um, a question of, uh, way early in your talk, uh, you gave a brief early history of Churchill and then you made a comment um, that when he was appointed to the, was it the something of the Navy? First um, Lord of the Admiralty. It, right, that um, um, somebody important, sorry, I don't know these names, um, uh, sent a message out that said Churchill is back. Um, but I, what, why, I mean, I understand that he was back in the government, but why did he have a, a history of being like a strategic thinker or being an effective manager or why was there this um, kind of joy in well, Churchill um, being back? He, um, had been First Lord of the Admiralty at the beginning of the First World War mm -hmm. in August 1914. And now at the beginning of the Second World War in September 1939, he gets the same position again. So that was a way of signaling. It's, it's not quite clear if this message was really sent or just drafted. That was a way of signaling to um, the British Navy ships, hundreds of them around the world, that Churchill was back as the civilian head of the Admiralty. Um, and I think Churchill was respected for his strategic thinking um, he, had, he was um, First Lord of the Admiralty beginning in 1911 and reformed a lot of things, made a lot of changes, converted the British fleet from coal to oil. And, you know, he was, he was um, a controversial figure and um, he didn't suffer um, people easily, um, but I, he was respected. Um, and during the Second World War, um, sometimes Churchill came up with ideas that um, the military professionals uh, didn't want to implement. And if they stood up to him, he would eventually give way. Um, if you were a doormat, Winston Churchill would step all over you. If you weren't vigorous and full of action, um, one of his famous sayings was action this day. Um, but to his credit, and I think he learned from the strategic lessons of the First World War, particularly the Gallipoli failure in 1915, which cost him his position in the cabinet. Um, I think he learned a lot from um, history. And he was always, always, always a great student of military history, going back to um, his famous ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. And there's an interesting parallel between his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough, assembling the coalition that defeated the continental aggressor of the 18th century, uh, Louis XIV, with Churchill's own role assembling the coalition that defeated the aggressor of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler. Mm. Okay, thank you. That that helps a lot. Um, so uh, we have a couple more minutes. If anyone sure. has a question, um, 
I'll just wait for just a second here. Um, well, I don't see any no notification to me that anyone's typing. So um, I want to thank you very much, Lee, for um, giving us this uh, wonderful presentation on Churchill and Roosevelt. Um, tremendous insights in these two gentlemen and the, the trials that they went through and the accomplishments that they had and how they influenced our history today. So um, thank you very much. And I hope to have you uh, back again with us soon. And let's do that in person, hopefully in 2022, when um, all will be well or better in the world. At least we can hope that. We can certainly hope that. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and uh, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.